What's up, everybody? We are back in saddle. Yes, those of you calling for a junta style uh, overthrow of the vanguard. <laughs> Unfortunately, your plans have been foiled. I have returned, but I thought Gavin did an excellent job holding down the fort yesterday. It was an awesome interview. I was sad to miss it, um, but I had work for you know espresso martini night anyways great job yeah. Gavin holding down the fort I appreciate it bro that was a fun interview always a little bit nerve-wracking coming out here uh, by yourself but definitely glad to have Zach back in the vanguard saddle um, and we got a good show today we have I was thinking Tyrone about leaving Kura. the left that was that was that was what I was <laughs> contemplating I had to take a pause a moment of pause I was like mm, should I and then I said no came back you know just came crawling back like an ex-boyfriend you know, missing one podcast every year. It's criminal. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty funny. At the beginning of the show, too, Bree even acknowledged the whole uh, Vanguard Boys meme. I don't know if you caught that. She yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, she was like, now Zach's not here. I can't call you the Vanguard Boys. Yeah, you're a Vanguard Boy now, Gavin. <laughs> yep. Oh, God. Anyway, that was a fun time. Hope you guys, enjo I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we got some more good interviews coming later. This month, we finally did get that Jill Stein interview scheduled. So that's going to be later in March. I don't want to officially announce any days just because of last time we did. And then it got rescheduled at the last minute. So I don't want to jinx this shit. But we should be having Dr. Stein on the podcast yesterday. Or not yesterday. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I was reading uh, this chat from Cosmic Wonder. Gavin's on drugs <laughs> already, guys. He, he It went to his head. He bought a bag after the fucking show yesterday. He's ready. He's ready. He's like, you know what? We're going to wind him up and let him cut loose. It's, it's your time, Gavin. Yeah, this is what the first like five minutes of the show were for, you know, getting my words figured out. Um, but yeah, it should be dialed exciting. in. You yeah. know, let's, I'm like an espresso machine. You know, it's like no matter what you do, no matter how good of an espresso machine you buy before you, you got to dial it in in the morning if you're pulling a lot of shots every day. Yep. Yep. Anyway, uh, should be a good show today. We got Tyrell Ventura joining us to talk a little bit about these rumors concerning his father. The former governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, potentially joining the RFK ticket. So super excited to get Tyrell's opinion on that. I also want to ask him about the Boeing thing. I was like, bro, we got to do a tinfoil hat segment while we have Tyrell here. Unless we're in a time crunch. But, oh, boy, I would love to get his thoughts on this. Because let me tell you what. I have, like, I, it, it, it sounds like, and I'll ask Tyrell how he likes to describe these kinds of things. Like, the conspiracy, my, like, sifting through what's fact and what's fiction whatever you want to call that um you know hobby tyrell chef's kiss that dude has taught me so much random shit and i'll be like really that happened and he'll be like oh yeah look back shit up that 100 percent happened everybody knows that that happened i'll be like i had no idea that shit happened anyway like he taught me how they hide aliens anyway tyrell's an interesting guy so i got to get his insight on the boeing pilot or the you know i don't know if he was a pilot but whistleblower he was whatever blower, yeah yeah yeah, absolutely. Super excited to get Ty in here to talk about that. Plus, we finally have some clips to react to from the Destiny versus Finkelstein debate, the long awaited debate. It was like Much five discussed. hours long. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've like only watched the clips, the highlight reel. I worked last night, so I haven't. I'll eventually probably listen to the whole thing, just wade through it, but it's going to yeah. take a while because it's uh, not the whole thing, but like, you know what I mean? I'll give it a good shot. Yeah, I came into the room the other night and my or last night, my girlfriend was just listening to it, but she was asleep and it was just still playing on the TV. So I was just like kind of sort of observe. Must absorbing have been real it. engaging. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine there are some drone in parts of that conversation. It's like, yeah. OK, we're doing this again. How many times can we go round and round about this? But Destiny said some absolutely deranged shit in this conversation. He was owned by Norm at least a few times per documented on Twitter. Or as was documented on Twitter. Jesus Christ, Gavin, that's infected. You know, it's infected me. Now neither of us can talk. We're just here. It's like, who gave us these roles? No wonder we only have 84 live viewers today. We've handicapped ourselves. Everybody's like, who the fuck are these morons? You guys, eh? yeah, they got 30,000 subs. Yeah, well, it must be legacy subs. These guys don't know what the fuck they're doing. How old are you anyway? Did you get this account started when you were 12? You know, rode the momentum of fucking, you know. Anyway. Yep. Um, got a super chat real quick before we start things off. Thank you, Brian, for the first super chat of the live stream. If Ventura was VP and he was the tie breaking vote on Israel aid in the Senate, would he support it as RFK would want or vote voter ag vote against it? I guess we'll ask uh, Tyrell, see if he has any insight into the answer to that question, Brian. I obviously don't want to speak for the, you know, for the governor. Um, I would 
only add that it would be hard hard to imagine a situation where we get a divided Senate on aid to Israel. That's I mean, I hope that that happens, but that means our senators have waken, woken the fuck up. You know what I mean? In this situation, almost, I mean, what, like 90% of Congress supports aid to Israel? Yeah. I think it's, and that's in the most recent round. I mean, for a long time, everybody just supported aid to Israel. There would be one or two votes against it, potentially from guys like Rand Paul and like, you know, the hardcore libertarian. I don't believe in sending aid, the isolationist wing of the Republican Party. But outside of that, I mean, it was always like aid to Israel, aid to Israel, aid to Israel. So I don't imagine that, you know, even in the unlikely situation where. Ventura finds himself as the vice president to uh, a RFK J, which we'll get into the likelihood of that later. Um, yeah, I don't think that he would end up in that situation. And I do know that Jesse is, you know, ardently anti-war. So in the face of these mass atrocities, I would, you know, I could, you know, make an assumption, but we'll ask Tyrell for clarity on that. Because I would like to, you know, what know what Jesse's thoughts are on the, you know, Israel situation as a, you know, former military man and lifelong peace activist. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever really heard Jesse speak at length about the Israel-Palestine conflict, so I, I can't really say for sure what his opinion is. But yeah, as you mentioned, Zach, you know, he's pretty freaking anti-war. I can't imagine that he's just like making an exception for this one, right? I mean, yeah, he came out uh, even and had the one of the most rational takes on the Russia invasion yep. of Ukraine, right? He was like, I, you know, I don't think that the United States needs to be fanning the flames of this and escalating with Vladimir Putin, but this is a crime. You know, the people of Ukraine have the right to resist. You know, you know what Putin's doing is illegal. It's an invasion of another sovereign country. Yada yada yada. I mean, what I feel like people don't give, you know, Ventura enough credit for is that he's actually pretty reasonable on a lot of issues. It's just like he's like that's what yep. people liked about him when he ran for governor. Is he was like, all right, like. This is just like a reasonable thing to do. Like, let's pursue that. You know what I mean? Like, okay, stop, stop putting people in jail for weed. Like, oh yeah, C Cuba and Fidel Castro, they want to buy some shit from the people of Minnesota. Like, that's stupid. If I say no, like, uh, yeah, you could buy shit from the people of Minnesota. This is America. Like, you know, let's start fostering a relationship here. You know, let's, um, you know, do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's 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 just water, Tony. That's a good old fashioned. That's actually a really that's a that's a nice bottle of water. See, this is the thing. People who say that they can't taste water really annoy me because it's like I I will drink tap water. Gavin will tell you. I'm like, you know, I know it's bad for me. I can envision all those rotting, <laughs> disgusting pipes. But if it's like late night, like I'll just like stick my head under the faucet and drink with the water. It's like I built up my immune system over a long time. Right. There's all kinds of lead, microplastics. You know, I'm, I'm sure all kinds of unbecoming shit inside my body. Right. Um, but uh Gavin over here, he's a water purist, and there is a decided taste difference. But boy, I don't have the, I don't have the, uh, what's the word, drive to mm. go out and actually get my reverse osmosis water every <laughs> single fucking day like Gavin does. This man, his he has commitment. I swear, I would have given up. I would have given up. And this guy's like, no, dude, like that's, you got to get your reverse osmosis water from your local community co-op. And I'm like, that's true. That is the best way to get your water. One of these days I'm going to come, I'm going to come over and Gavin will be like, oh yeah, I've actually been showering with my reverse osmosis water. You know, I've got a little install over here, you know, just, like one some of people will things. tell you to take it that far. They're like, I know, dude, use the <laughs> tap water to brush your teeth. Don't use it to shower. That, there I'm are like, a lot right, of people chill. in Johnson <laughs> County that have a little bottle of water that they use for brushing their teeth. Um, that's like that's a real thing in the yuppier parts of town, you know, where that's funny because Johnson County apparently has like amazing the best tap water, water in yeah. the country. It constantly rates in the top five counties in the nation. It's like us, <laughs> Orange County, uh, uh, Vermont has really good water. Um, a lot of places have really good water. It's just America is so unequal that you could find a place where there's rich people that really fucking care about the water quality. And then they will absolutely fuck wherever the poor people are. Like it's like Elysium. You know what I mean? Anyway. <laughs> wow. yeah if you read yep. the comments from yesterday people are like wow this conversation stayed on track a lot i'm like yeah you know it's what i add and take away from this podcast you know it's the yin and yang no that's the best thing about our dynamic honestly it's like neither of us feel afraid to just get off into the weeds talk about what we want to in no it's our podcast presence. yeah exactly exactly and people can watch the clips if they don't want to hear us yammering 
it is what it is. I think people enjoy that though. I mean, it's a live stream. Like, I don't know what else people would expect from a live stream. It's not going to be like a scripted freaking bullet point PowerPoint kind of a deal. Yeah, see, you guys, Gavin will defend me, so you guys can go ahead and hate. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Yo. uh, anyway, shout out to you, Brian. Does uh, Ventura disagree with RFK on Ukraine aid? Uh, that's another question for the governor. Uh, from what I understand about Jesse's politics is that, you know, I think that Jesse would be totally fine sending things like blankets, things like food, things like, uh, you know, resources to rebuild destroyed homes. You know, he's a humanitarian guy. I just don't think that he I would imagine that he would probably draw the line similarly to us. But I don't fucking know, uh, you know, on things like anti-tank missiles or, or things that will make it look like we're taking an obvious side in this war, which we have as a society have said, hey. We don't really think it's quite our place to take a side in this war in that way. Now, people will tell you that we stroke like we, you know, we 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 kind of sowed the seeds for this war. And it's like, yeah, we, we did. But at some point, you got to back up and say, hey, you know, listen, bro, like we got to renegotiate. And I think that Jesse would also be pro pro diplomatic efforts. Yeah. <laughs> LOL. I 100% agree. Also, this is funny. Kevin looked like a lost puppy without Zach and no clue what to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> see everybody it's yin and yang <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> shout out to you ron well you ron well where were you where were you to help with gavin with the you know you you're always good for a few tangents uh my question for tyrell if rfk picks jesse for a vp do you think rfk would regain those ceasefire palestine voters back or is it too late to regain those voters back that he lost as in too much damage yeah that's a great question and i think a lot of this will be answered uh, when we ask Tyrell, like, how much validity is there to these rumors, right? Because at the end of the day, we haven't heard anything from the governor yet. And that's kind of a critical guy to hear from. And, uh, you know, nobody will, you know, speak more clearly on behalf of the governor than Tyrell. And that's what I've been waiting for, because obviously, like, it's fun. We come out here, we speculate, we have a good time. But at the end of the day, like, the governor is going to have, like, a serious position for anything as prestigious as the vice president. Um, and also, I'm not sure how he'll feel about being spouted off along a fucking crackpot like Aaron Rodgers. Like, uh, to me, that was disrespectful. That was fucking like cringy of RFK to do that. Um, so anyway, because Aaron Rodgers has absolutely no pedigree. He's literally just a fucking dingus. He was like spreading Sandy Hook conspiracy theories that reemerged, like just like a bunch of weird shit. Yeah. Also, sorry, guys. I accidentally sent uh, Tyrell the just the link to the show we're doing like the actual youtube link instead of the stream yeah watch link. us yeah wow <laughs> where is he well we can't find him anywhere yeah. all right one it's okay this is a diy leftist production everybody you know what you've signed up for if you wanted to watch something refined you'd have to let a corporation run it for you so it's again yin and yang fellas oh man i'm excited to be back though this is taking a day off. You know, you watch from the sidelines. You're like, so this is how it feels to sit on the bleachers. <laughs> you know, it's like Jordan with an ankle sprain. You know what I mean? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I'll be the Scotty Pippen with an ankle sprain. You still feel like shit on the bench. No, I'm kidding. All right. Uh -oh. Tyrell says he's about to jump on. So Sweet. just hold tight, everybody. And yeah, shout out to you. Ron well thank you so much for the 10 bucks that's really generous if i if i had to give my opinion on that i would say that probably it's still too late to gain a lot of those uh you know ceasefire voters back unless you know unless like jesse were to join the ticket and then just totally change rfk's mind like get him to totally change his tune and just you know say the opposite of what he currently says then maybe there would be enough time left to like get some of those folks back some of the people who really care about this issue back um but yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be tough for rfk to get those people back and from what i've heard like that is his staunchly held position it's it's something he feels very seriously about i guess it's like you know something his family has felt very seriously about so now he just carries the torch Bro, um, here's the thing. Here's the thing that's so insane. Okay. And I don't want to go on a tangent about the Kennedy family. Joe Kennedy, he's the guy that, you know, started it all. Okay. Uh, he got hooked up with this guy, Honey Fitzgerald. Okay. Who was uh, his father in law. And that's when he got introduced to the whole nebulous and the bootlegging and the, you know, pulling yourself up. But he wanted, he was obsessed with being a socialite. Okay. And uh, so he had sons. They were very handsome, well behaved, like, you know, the whole nine yards. He was a Boston you know, guy. And he wanted the highest position 
uh, like a socialite could acquire in those days. And this is under FDR. FDR fucking hated Joe Kennedy because he represented the part of the country that was extremely soft on Nazis. So while he was the fucking ambassador to England, which he got by, uh, you know, plying uh jimmy uh roosevelt james roosevelt uh, the son of fdr with like pussy and fucking booze and you know all that kind of shit uh he got appointed to be ambassador to england and he had to resign in shame because he was like working with the nazis like he like he was there was a german bank that he was very involved with it, it's fucking crazy guys like alan dulles these guys were all working with german bankers like un trying to undermine fdr as he fought the nazis it's completely erased by history now he wants to come back and be like my family's always back <laughs> start with israel i'm like dude you can't fucking have your cake and eat it too it's like you want to break with your family's history but it's like anyway we're gonna move on we'll put a pin in that for a second and we're gonna be joined by tremendous friend of the show uh, all around great guy uh you know fellow tinfoil hatter on occasion you know uh always watching the hawks shout out to tyrell ventura how you doing man oh man what a beautiful beautiful and wonderful introduction you just gave me thank you so much for that i oh, feel uh, i feel feel touched feel touched <laughs> yeah how's it going man welcome back to the show yeah i, I mean you know it's been a very kind of calm non-eventful week over here in the ventura household you know not a lot's been going on um a lot of just you know kind of bored staring at the wall I haven't been on my phone or you know feet feet you know getting calls from cnn and fox news and the new york times things like that none of that's been happening whatsoever it's been very very quaint just, a, yeah, just so. a, your average day in minnesota mm -hmm. <laughs> your average day in minnesota yes yeah but, i guess we uh, can <laughs> go ahead and talk a little bit about the elephant in the room the other day got some articles some of which we reacted to on the show and your own father the former governor of minnesota jesse ventura listed here along with uh, aaron Rodgers as a potential running mate for rfk jr definitely caught me by surprise i mean i mean not because jesse wouldn't make a great running mate i think he would um but i just didn't know that that's where rfk's head was to be honest um what, what was your reaction to seeing this in the in the news and what's the validity of it uh well number one there's been as i as i've told numerous uh outlets and things like that there's there's been no official talks whatsoever uh about bringing jesse on as vp they have not asked uh for him to be vp or in any capacity like that um you know jesse and robert kennedy jr have known each other for a pretty long time i want to say going back to even before like 2010 um in fact they in one of jesse's previous books i think it was don't start the revolution without me he wrote a fictional chapter um at the end of that book, kind of talking about what a hypothetical run for Jesse as president would look like. And in that time, which I can't, I think that book was written like before 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he had written uh, that he was going to be running for president that, and, and that he would pick RFK Jr. to be his vice president. Uh, in his original book, and and with the idea being that, I, I, you know, I think that in the fictional book he gets assassinated on the campaign trail, and then Robert Kennedy becomes becomes president. Um, they've had a friendship for a long time. They don't see eye to eye politically on a few, you know, pretty big issues. Um, but you know, they, Jesse's always been a big proponent of third parties and people trying to kind of shake up the system and and, and third party candidates and things like that. So I think where a lot of all of this kind of rumor came from and where the conjecture came from, and I can't speak for what talks go on inside RFK's campaign camp. I mean, maybe they maybe they were having this discussion, but you know, no one's ever officially asked Jesse this. I think, like I said, I think the rumor and all of that kind of came out of um, Jesse did an appearance uh at a at a get essentially like a, a rally in in arizona to help uh get rfk on the ballot and jesse is a big believer that third parties should be represented on the ballot him and rfk have been friends for a long time and so he stood up you know he, he supported him on on that day um but you know as he's tweeted as he said numerous times he supports all candidates who are kind of fighting that that two-party system or or who want to kind of challenge those those kind of things maybe not every single candidate because we know there's a few real nutsos out there but uh but anybody trying to really overturn the apple card jesse's behind yeah, uh, I saw uh, in Politico they reported that after Jesse spoke with uh, 
you know, or, or you know, open for RFK in Tucson, that there was a poll that they done internally in the campaign that said that he was the most favorable vice presidential candidate choice for uh, people they pulled under the age of 30, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was really interesting because, you know, uh, we we were uh, you know talking with you about this uh, maybe a few times ago, but you know you were asking about how, you know how people of our age you know kind of came across Jesse Ventura in the first place, and it's like most people don't have like a weird like oh well you know kind of bummed some of his style when we were kind of coming up with the format for the show, um, but uh, most people just knew him from RT like kind of ranting a little bit you know. Uh, which I just thought was extremely interesting. And then also going back and learning that he was one of the few independent uh, guys to ever make it to, you know, an executive branch of government like the governor of Minnesota. So it, it's not like it doesn't make sense for him to kind of pursue uh, him uh, as, a, as a vice president. But you'd think he would potentially lean into, you know, discussions. Of course, I don't know what happens behind the scenes over there. But the other thing that surprised me was that there haven't been other candidates that are kind of using uh, or, or, you know, his uh, services, his volunteering to kind of open for other candidates, because I think that the Green Party would be well served, or Cornell mm -hmm. West's candidacy would be well served, or Gloria Delary, or, or you know, or whoever, uh, uh, Claudia, Del you know, whoever's running for um, office in this juncture. A lot of the third party candidates, really good people, you know, ballot access is a struggle. Um, I don't know. I'm always surprised that it's always it always seems to be like there's a skepticism of that and then when you pull people they're like yeah we love seeing jesse come out so i don't know it always seems to be a disconnect between the you know even the political fringe and mm. uh harnessing that I, well I, you know it's interesting because i think that you know there it like you know from talking to you guys and also just you know over the years of just you know working well especially over the last couple of years with working with we're working with my father and, and kind of helping him uh you know run his his quote unquote brand dare i use that word um you know uh it's interesting to see the amount of positive feedback uh, people from all ages have been like you know sending his way you know you always get the detractors who like to disagree with him on something politically but you know he is generally especially in the last few years uh and especially here in the state of minnesota um we've seen a, a really big kind of outpouring outpouring of of I don't want to say nostalgia, but he is 72. Um, but I think there's a lot of people that kind of saw what he did as governor uh, and just the other kind of amazing things that he's done in his life. And it's interesting, you know, and they and they suddenly realize, yeah, you know, things weren't, you know, at least Jesse, when he was governor, was honest. I might have disagreed with him on a few things politically, but like I knew that he was speaking from the heart. And I think people are really hungry for that. You know, they know that it, it's so rare that you come across people uh, especially in the in the realm of politics or doing political talk shows or things of that nature where you you legitimately feel this person believes in what they're saying and they're not just saying it to fit into a particular ideology or party or or something like that that you know Jesse's kind of always just spoken from his heart right or wrong you know yeah. whether you agree with his policy or not or his thoughts or ideas you know he's coming to it from an honest place and I've seen him change his mind on issues over the years, you know, which I think is also very rare when you're talking about uh, political figures and commentators and people like that, you very rarely see them admit like, oh yeah, no, I thought one way about that, but after thinking about it, hearing other opinions, researching, oh, I feel this way about it, you know? And so I think that's kind of a rare thing. And, and I think that's what probably a lot of people, I would hope that's one of the many reasons that people kind of look at Jesse and, and say, yeah, this is a guy I can, I can, I can vibe with as a guy I can get behind. I think it's also really compelling. And, and I, you mentioned nostalgia for this. I think it is. It has to be partly generational just because I think it's fading. But there's a certain, you know, kind of guy that believes in the, in the you know, you know, the I believe in America, like, you know, believes that, you know, if you work hard, if you reach people, if you go out there, it's like, yeah, dude, when I'm in power, like, you know, in power, like, you know, the governor of an elect, you know, electoral process. Right. But, uh, you know, I'm going to just try and do common sense shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, hey, like we should stop hassling people for smoking weed. That's a freedom issue. Like, you know, we should, you know, oh, the government has leftover money. Like, you know, maybe I disagreed with that, but it was a common sense kind of 90s position. You know what I mean? Kind of believing in this concept of like, I want to be the change in America, believing that you can change the system, believe that the system can work. A lot of people don't believe that the system can work anymore. So when you have a guy like Jesse who just speaks, you know, uh, from the heart, who just gets up there and, you know, 
earnestly believes in the power of uh, the American government, I feel like it's refreshing because it's not an angle. It's just like, you know, talking to like a regular dude that's like, I want this country to be great. And you don't mm -hmm. get a lot of that anymore. And it, usually when you do, it's a line of bullshit from people who are trying to like, you know, sell you evangelicalism. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to get that kind of line of bullshit from Jesse. And, you know, that's the thing. It's it's like, you know, so when I see it, when you know, when you tell me a poll like that, it's very uplifting to hear, you know, because you, you and the one thing that I think what I love about, you know, my generation and younger is that we also we love going down rabbit holes. We love like learning things about about whether it be subjects or people or things like that. And, you know, uh, Jesse for the Internet age as a figure is an interesting like when you start delving into his life and his career and the things he's done and what formulated his beliefs and why or why he changed his mind about something or, or things like that. It's a fascinating journey to go down. And, you know, I mean, obviously I say that because he's my dad, so I'm a little biased, but, you know, but, but, you know, he's, he's led a truly fascinating life. And I think that that can speak to a lot of people. Um, and also I think, yeah, I think people, you know, we live in very cynical times, rightfully so, you know, and, but, and so I think that there, and, and Jesse has some deep cynicism about certain aspects of the U S government and things like that, as you guys well know, um, but I think there is uh, there is a room for someone who speaks of of hope, not in the branded like Barack Obama, what became kind of a branded political ideology of hope, but actual hope that that this country can move forward, that you can believe in the strength of the people of this country, because that's ultimately what our government try is supposed to be is a representation of the people of this country, and that's what you have to fight for to get back, uh, since we have lost that uh for, for all intents and purposes yeah totally i mean I, I think that in some ways i've always viewed the governor as someone who's like uniquely capable of uh attracting people from both the le the left and the right as an independent a lot of independents you know they kind of have uh a more of a left wing or a right wing appeal but i really feel like jesse ventura is a man of the people you know he's he's uniquely able to reach everyone because people know that he's honest like you're saying and obviously uh people on the right you know they probably like the fact that he's a self-made man that he's a tough guy obviously the military background there's all that good stuff um but on the left he has uh real credibility as well uh but he's not a freaking virtue signaler you know he's not one mm. of these people that goes out here and virtues uh, about how how you know progressive he is and how much better he is than everyone else no he just has those positions and they're uh common sense positions and they speak to people on the left and give him credibility and those are reasons why i thought he would actually make a good running mate for rfk also because of the fact that he doesn't agree with rfk on everything it seems like a lot of candidates you know they have this idea where it's like my vice president needs to be someone who's just subservient to me like someone who's just kind of a lackey or someone who'll just like kamala. back me up yeah kamala you know mike pence someone like that um i actually do like the thinking even if it isn't rooted in reality. I do like the thinking that someone like Robert Kennedy Jr., who I have many disagreements on, um, but that he would choose someone to be his running mate who actually, you know, reflects the viewpoints of those who disagree with him because he does hold some pretty uh, controversial positions, specifically on the vaccine. Um, and I think that, you know, that would actually kind of balance out the ticket with someone like your father, who's uh, kind of taken the opposite stance on the vaccine, at least from what I remember. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, the governor has no, changed he, his mind or anything. But. No, not at all. He still he still believes that, that you know, when it comes to public health issues, that you, you have to err on the side of public health. And now later on, if, the, if you know, you discover certain things were done poorly or done maliciously or things like that, well, then you deal with that problem after the fact. But in the initial go of it, like, you know, you have to you know public health is number one he does you know he has his it, certain issues and things like that but they do disagree on on that fundamentally um but but the thing with my dad is he's always willing to listen but, you know and and he would hope that the person sitting across from him is also willing to listen you know right. and that's something that i think we've lost in a lot of our political ideology and discussions these days is that you know jesse will fight like hell for his viewpoint you know and he will and he will grind it but he wants you to fight back equally hard with your viewpoint like that's how I've, how I how I've won arguments with my father on things of like political nature. Um, student loans actually would be one I can point to as like an internal one where, you know, I was I had to really fight tooth and nail to get my dad to see 
how the student loan system was abusing people in a way beyond, you know, because my dad had a very, you know, at that time, that very kind of boomer 1980s, 1970s ideology of like, hey, if you took on the loans, pay tough back. on you, figure out yeah. how to pay them back. Sure. And it took me work to really get Jesse to see the other side of that. And then eventually he did. And he did realize, hey, this was actually a predatory system that was designed to hurt people. And it wasn't just about someone complaining about their bills. This was actually a mass of people who were getting fucked over by the system, you know, and who were promised uh, a, a way to better their life and were blatantly lied to and then had their loan passed around from different agencies and made it to where they could never feasibly pay it back in their lives when you combine it with the rest of the economic issues that people face in today's day and age. And so, you know, seeing my dad change his mind like that was a beautiful thing. And it show, you know, again, it, it goes back to that. You know, he has very serious, you know, disagreements with with Robert Kennedy. I don't know if they've ever like really sat in a room and hashed them out. Sure. I know that would be too them you know and figure out hey what is uh you know what do we disagree on here and let's this is my stance what's your stance you know let's talk about yeah. this um would love to know. be a fly on the wall for that discord oh my goodness <laughs> that would be an amazing discussion you know my dad disagrees with his stance on on gaza and, and and what's going on there you know my dad is peace first you know you find every out you find every route to peace and and you you do not you know my dad's always been that way and he doesn't want to see conflict anywhere let alone in gaza or ukraine or anywhere you know yeah. he is a he's very very anti i think that's informed by his military experience as a guy who actually like especially at such a young age i feel like people forget that like it's it was so normalized back then to be like a 17 18 year old kid and then like to go to special ops training like i am 26 years old and i'm like fuck that like you know what i mean and i feel like part of being 18 is like you don't have that instinct to just be like fuck no what do you mean you want me to go somewhere i'm gonna come back with no legs no thank you you know what i mean but then you're like you're 18 years old and they put you in this situation and it's hard as fuck and it's basically experimental at that time the new navy seals you know crosswater frogmen as your dad calls it you know what i mean and then you get sent out over there and you see all this shit that fucking ain't good. And then, you know, like it, some people, I feel like never that like, they like they never touch it. It never, it never, you know what I mean? It's like, it's too much. Like, and I get that, you know, it's well, and Jesse up. saw both sides. Like, cause you remember in his era too, there was the draft. You turned 18, unless you oh, came for money, you didn't have a choice. You know, yeah. you didn't have a choice to go. You had to go, <laughs> you know? So Jesse actually volunteered because he kind of said, well, you know, he, he he came from a long line of soldiers. You know, uh, my, you know, my great grand or my grandmother was a nurse uh, in North Africa. My grandfather was, a, you know, uh, I believe, a, a, you know, he served in Europe and, and, and Italy and the Battle of the Bulge and Normandy and took Germany and like the whole bit, you know, um, you know, I think it was a seven or eight, you know, battle stars. Um, you know, so my dad came for that. His older brother was a SEAL. You know, so like my dad came from a very military background and in my dad's experiences, you know, he saw kids in his neighborhood getting drafted, you know, he, he you know, as he was growing up because he kind of joined the, law, the war more towards the end of the Vietnam War than the beginning. Um, but he watched that take place and, and to still then volunteer and do it, despite my grandfather telling him at the time that it was a bullshit war and it was only for money. And then my dad had to go and serve and then come back and look my grandfather in the eye, his father, and say, yeah, dad, you were right. It, it was all bullshit. Like what <laughs> they were telling us about the domino effect and communism was all pure bullshit. I yeah. realize that now having been there. Um, uh. And then to come back, though, and then get the soldier experience as tragic it was in that day where you had a lot of people in that day. I don't think you'd see it today, thank God. But in that day, the anti-war sentiment obviously was huge during the 60s and 70s against the Vietnam War. But a part of that, as tragic as is, there was a lot of anti-war sentiment expressed towards the actual soldiers who went to fight. Yeah. And so my dad came back and also got that kind of flack too for just having served. You know, so it, they did, you know, there was, there was, they weren't a time, not every, not everybody in the anti-war movement then, but there was parts of it that couldn't see past that it wasn't the soldier's fault. They're yeah. just being sent, you know. Um, and so it definitely shaped his views strongly to say there's no there's no justifiable reason for bloodshed. You know, there's no justifiable reason to start a war, to invade, uh, and to commit atrocities that like the kinds that we see today. Yeah. And I mean, I just got to say, if it weren't for RFK's position on Israel, which I 
just disagree with like as much as I possibly could disagree with any take ever. Um, I would probably be like supporting the guy, like I, as much as I have disagreements with him on vaccines and stuff. Like I actually think he's a significant improvement on Biden and Trump when it comes to foreign policy on just about every other issue. Like not that I a hundred percent agree with him on Ukraine, but I was, I, I thought it was refreshing to hear someone pushing back against the American foreign policy, the, you know, orthodoxy of just funding and escalating this war. It was refreshing to hear him pushing back. It's been refreshing to hear him push back on other things. Obviously, he has a pretty impressive history as an environmental lawyer. I agree with him on a lot of the stuff about the environment. Mm -hmm. Um, But I really do feel like this Israel position is just holding uh, RFK back a lot as far as uh, reaching basically anyone on the left. Um, I think he could reach a lot of people on the left if it weren't for this position. You, you, you know, it's interesting when suddenly it's like Chuck Schumer is opposite of RFK on an issue. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you guys exactly. saw that, but Chuck Schumer actually spoke out and said that Netanyahu is a block is, is a, is yep. a, is a block to, to, to pee. I was, I almost fell over in my chair when I saw that. So, and, and I don't know what'll become of that and things like that, but what it does show me is that you can still change the political direction. It might not come as quickly, tragically in this case, as we want it here in this country, but you can at least see that, that it's, it's infiltrating the thought process, all of the pro, you know, every, all the people's protesting, all of the voices who have spoken out against what's happening there. You can now see it bleeding in, whether it's a good reason that they're changing it or a purely a campaign reason there doesn't often matter if it can ultimately end what's happening there. Yep. Yep. Also, just to answer the super chat from Brian, thanks for the five bucks, Brian. I disagree with Gavin. If you die as president, why would you want a VP who disagrees with you on major issues as your oh. replacement? That's fair. Uh, I was coming at that from someone who disagrees with RFK Jr. So I was like, if he's going to choose a vice president, I'd rather him choose someone who agrees more with me on these issues, someone like uh, the governor. But obviously, I understand what you're saying, Brian. That could create some chaos as far as the agenda goes. If all of a sudden, two years in, you're dead, and then someone who has radically different beliefs takes your spot. Um, a really interesting dynamic, actually. Yeah, Harry be, Truman all over just, again. You know, right? What I mean? it would be yeah. a really interesting dynamic where, hey, the right and the left came together. We got a left uh, president and a right VP, and oh, the left president goes away. Now we got a right VP. Change yeah. course. Although that'd be a, it's that'd not be a like weird it would... situation. It's not like it would be a surprise, though, because obviously when people go to vote for the you know president, they vote for president and vice president. So you know what you're signing up for. You know that if the top dog goes down, if he dies, then you you're saddled with the VP pick. Um, so it's not like it, there's anything un- un- undemocratic about it. People know what they're voting for. Like I said, um, that that does uh, bring to mind, though, Tyrell, you mentioned Vin- uh, Jesse Ventura. He has not actually officially been offered the vice presidential role if it were to happen, you know, in the next week or so, if if RFK called up and said, hey, Governor Ventura, I want you to serve as my vice president. In, in your opinion, obviously, you're not your father, but in your opinion, do you think that Jesse might actually take him up on that? I think in the timeline that, that RFK has set out, uh, which is what next week, I think end of next week is the 26th of March or something like that. Um, I think in that timeline, Jesse wouldn't have enough time to make that decision properly. And I don't think he would. You know, that's the kind of decision that changes your entire life uh, from front to back, up, down, left, right, and sideways. Um, and if he, you know, if he was actually like approached with that, uh, A, it would, I don't know. I can't speak for my father. I can't, I can't, you know, speak to that. I don't even know if they will. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know if given this kind of tight squeeze between when, He's saying he's making this announcement, and today, as we're talking, if that would really be enough time, especially having, you know, come into it cold, so to speak, uh, if that would be enough time for dad, because Jesse's seventy-two years old, and, and he, you know, he has some major things in the works that we're working on that, you know, that uh, are gonna definitely be historical and definitely be game changing and, and definitely be wildly fun and interesting. I can't break it yet, but you know, um, so that would play in the role. Uh, my mother and the family would play a role that, that it, it, that's not a lot of time to consider that, that option. So I can't speak to whether he would say yes or no. Um, but I know that he would need a lot more time to contemplate that decision and, and get his life in order to be prepared for that kind of decision uh, more so than, than March 26th, but I don't know. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know. It just it also depends too, if Jesse would want to run, you know, with RFK Jr. You know, it, it just depends on where his head's at. I don't know. 
I think he should demand the top of the ticket, just like in his uh, book, in that last chapter of the book you referenced. That'd and be an say, interesting hey, look ticket, here, wouldn't? look here, Robert. Yeah. You're going to be my VP. <laughs> Who was governor, not you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who has more political experience? <laughs> um, no, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, the whole dynamic of all of this was really interesting because it so came out of, like, left field for us, you know. And and then it was, like, you know, seeing that list of, like, it was Aaron Rodgers and uh, – and I think it was like Tulsi Gabbard was was people that they had apparently talked to. Tony Robbins, which was an yeah, odd one. I didn't Robbins. know Tony Robbins had like mad political vibes going on beyond just self help. Um, you know, it was a very bizarre list to be kind of thrown into. It is into. a bizarre list. It but then again, speaks- this is a bizarre year that we have for president, right? Yeah. I mean, this is a weird campaign. If you'd have told me five years ago, ten years ago that the 2024 presidential campaign would be Cornell West, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And Trump and Biden, I don't think any of us would have ever predicted this coming. We could have made a fortune in Vegas if you could bet on these kind of things. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, it, it's definitely interesting. I wish that there would have been you know, more push for a debate from all those unique characters to actually have to square off in a public discussion. I think mm. that would be good to hear from everybody. Uh, you know, see just how fucking old and outdated Joe Biden and Donald Trump both are. Obviously, Joe Biden is just, I mean a shell of himself at this point but donald trump is no spring chicken and i feel like he's been able to hide that a lot with us you know the spray tan and the fake hair and you know the glitz and glam and whatnot but this dude is old and he forgets this shit too and if he's president for four more years he's gonna start to you know malfunction like a robot just like joe biden uh you know i mean look at what's his face mitch mcconnell had to step back from uh senate uh leadership because he just doesn't know where he is anymore I like how they never use that excuse either. You know, the man froze like twice on camera. God knows how many times that's happened off camera too. You know, did, I, I doubt he reserved those times. moments for yeah. only on camera. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of one of those moments where it's like, you know, and and look, I <laughs> violently, well, violent, well, I strongly disagree with Mitch McConnell and what he's brought to to public office and what he's done with his career in public office. And you never want to, and I'm I'm a good heart. I never want to like, you know, speak as evil as somebody is, you never want to, I never, myself, I never want to like, you know, speak badly about their health condition and things like that. But if anything, this is a sign that could we please get new blood? Can we please stop electing the same people over and over and over and over again to where now you, you know, you have people from McConnell to Pelosi. I mean, God, they had to drag Feinstein out of there. I mean, my God, you know, I, you know, I, I still remember the days of Strom Thurmond where they were the wheeling Reaper him in and he had an Dying IV Feinstein. attached to him. You know, yeah. like, I, you know, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Can we please get like some youth in politics? You yeah. know, it, because at the end of the day, you know, you got you got people grandstanding over the ban of TikTok. 75 percent of Congress, given their age, probably has never even used TikTok, nor do they even understand how it works. Yeah. You know, and now they're going to be voting on it. You they, know, have they have one bit of on bipartisan it. legislation, and it's to ban TikTok. Are you fucking kidding me? It's like, are you are you serious? Like, you could not embody the you know boomer nature, and not even boomer. Like the the a lot of people they were the generation that parented the fucking baby boomers. It's nuts to think about that because you're like, wait, when were you born? You were born in the forties, and you're in government right now you're 80 years old are you fucking nuts go home go swing a golf club if you can manage it go sit on the beach and smoke a cuban i don't fucking care don't cover well in the old days they used to leave because they'd get those like cushy jobs that all the lobbying money that was sent to them all uh, throughout their term and then they get those cushy you know like c-suite jobs where they just get paid to sit on a board and things like that but now that they can you know trade stocks like Pelosi, they don't need to leave you know like hey i'm rich now <laughs> you know yep. so you know and that's that's the the truly ugliness of our system today is that we've and and look you know i hate to say this and maybe people will flame the hell out of me for saying this but ultimately this is our fault this is us the voters fault because we're the ones who keep putting our vote down now granted there's a lot standing in the way of that in terms of who we're offered you know, and how the, the systems are rigged and things like that and the gerrymandering that takes place. But at the end of the day, we keep electing them. You know, no one's proven to me yet that the vote is completely rigged and that when you go in and fill out your ballot and slide it in, that like what you vote for doesn't count. Uh, that hasn't been proven yet. Um, contrary to, was it 100 mules or whatever the hell that bullshit was? <laughs> um, you know, 3,000, whatever the hell it was. Um, 
you know, so ultimately this still does fall back on all of us, you, you know, us three, the people watching and listening right now, it's on us to vote for the right people and not vote for the same tired bullshit all the time to, that puts people in office for, you know, 20 years. It's ridiculous. Yeah. hundred percent, man. hundred percent. Um, it's also a problem. I think that much of the voting electorate is made up of older people you know boomers it seems like they are the most reliable demographic of people that go to vote and you know progressive politicians specifically have found that out over and over again when they think oh this time i'm going to rely on the youth vote and i'm going to get elected uh, by the younger generations i'm going to go after them and inspire them nope never happens um i mean obviously bernie sanders got a lot of young people to vote for him but not enough to to kind of supersede the older boomer uh voting base and and that's you know why we part of the reason why we keep seeing um you know people like joe biden donald trump get elected it's just because younger people don't vote which is really unfortunate um yeah what's your opinion tyrell on the state of the 2024 election let's take your father out of it assume that rfk picks you know aaron Rodgers, someone else of that ilk what's your you know prediction how this is all going to shake out do you think he actually has chances of becoming like a, a ross perot type figure that actually does better than expected if him or cornell west i think actually got on all 50 ballots i think that you would definitely see a very strong contingent of people vote for either of those people even maybe even jill stein too i don't know she's been at the game for so long it's hard to yeah. you know but but I think with Cornell and with with RFK, I think that they, uh, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, they do have they 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 do they do galvanize and and inspire people to vote for them, you know. And I think that if if you allowed those two individuals to truly compete, I think that I think that you would see a much more interesting race play out, because I don't think that the trump or biden are really inspiring anyone beyond their very you know limited base of people that just are do or die by them no matter what um there's always this kind of thing where it's like rfk is going to take all these votes from biden i i truly believe too he's going to take a lot of votes from trump too you know if he gets especially in the if he picks someone like Aaron Rodgers, right you know i think that he is he speaks to enough of that side with some of these viewpoints that that like we all disagree with and things like that that you could see them jumping ship from trump because of the idiocracy that is donald trump's campaign and and who he who he is um and so you could see that kind of take place where he would end up pulling from both sides I still and I, I still don't really, and maybe I'm wrong, but uh, you know I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Nobody is, despite what uh, all of the prognosticators on CNN and MSNBC and Fox would would want you to believe. Um, I still kind of feel in my in my gut that Biden's going to be replaced before the convention. I think they haven't replaced him now, given all of the foreign policy things that are taking place. And you don't want to have somebody be a dead, you know, a dead, a dead fish. You don't want to have them be dead. They're, you know, because if he says I'm not running now, then he's just a lame duck. And then whatever he says or tries to do with the Senate and Congress, all that it doesn't matter. Right. They'll just ignore him. I really do believe that they're going to swap him out right before the convention or during, you know, or something of that nature, maybe with the Gavin Newsom, who seems to be pretty popular in those Biden circles. Um, you know, I, I could realistically see that, especially if the polls keep going the way they're going, because they have to know, maybe they're that blind. I, I can't. Trump is up in every swing state by like, that's five what I mean, points. I mean, maybe they're blind enough to believe it, but, but I, I have to imagine, and maybe I'm giving the Democratic Party as a whole too much intelligence, um, because they haven't shown it in the past. Um, I, I just, I feel like they're going to swap him out. I feel like at some point they'll do a thing where, you know, oh, you know, I'm, I realize something happens, blah, 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 whatever excuse they want to make up that seems legitimate. And they can make up any excuse they want because they have the, the hunting their... accident at Camp David. <laughs> <laughs> he goes hunting with Dick Cheney. Um, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, whatever excuse they want to use, they'll get the media behind it, you know, so it's not even a worry about, does it make sense? Um, I could I could easily see him getting swapped out for someone like Newsom or something like that because to me Gavin's kind of been running a weird shadow campaign sort of anyway. Totally. And and I could see him saying, "All right, me and Camel are going to pick this up and I'm going to do this in honor of Joe, blah 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 blah." And away you go. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I think that honestly, 
they would be able to get away with it, even if it meant denying Kamala the top of the ticket, which a lot of people talk about being a big deal because obviously she is the first uh, female vice president, first vice president of color, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so a lot of people think, well, that's going to be awkward, right? And it definitely would be awkward not to give her the top spot to give it like some uh, to give it to someone like Gavin Newsom instead. Uh, but I think that most people in the Democratic Party, they just know in their heart, they feel that he's a much better candidate. So they wouldn't actually care that much. Like it might be awkward for a while, but once the band-aids ripped off, I think most people would probably get over it and just be relieved that neither Biden nor Kamala is still, you know, at the top of the ticket, uh, which I do think is an increasingly just bad situation for voters. And I think most voters know that even people that love the Democrats that are, you know, not like us, not people that have any appetite for an independent or third party movement, but are just, you know, solidly uh, Democrat. You know, I think that those people, they also know they have eyes, they have ears, and they want a champion that's able to take down Donald Trump. They want someone that's able to go out there and really go toe to toe with him and make a fool of him. And they know that's not Biden and they know it's not Kamala. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if Gavin Newsom would be able to pull it off, but he definitely has a much better chance of doing it than either of those two, in my opinion. I, 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 and, and look, I'm not in a way endorsing Gavin Newsom or anything like that. Obviously. Please don't. Yeah. You know, but I think By that Ralph if you look at, snubs yeah. his own father and snubs his comes own out father. strong support. For I am Gavin such a Newsom. corporate Democrat. Let me tell you, I sat down and read some, uh, was it, <laughs> I read some books. He's been subscribed to the Atlantic. To speeches. Folks. <laughs> I've read Obama's book front to back 18 times this last Open week. Uh, I'm a big fan of Hillary Clinton all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> no, um, but I do, you know, but honestly, like, like when you look at it, it's like, I think that like someone like Gavin, if you're a Democrat and you, and you want to go that route, someone like Gavin, at least you know, can debate properly. Right. You know that he could actually get up there Function and, and, and as a properly being, functionally yeah. debate yeah. Donald Trump. Uh, at least, you know, um, I, I just, yeah, something in me tells me that that's what we're going to see because I just can't see them really pressing ahead. But then again, they're the Democrats. They will they will do everything they can to lose an election. Yep. It's like they want to. <laughs> I, so, some people have also made the point that, like, you know, he, we like to imagine this, like, you know, cabal of people that are very highly calculated and sophisticated. But a lot of people point out that the reality oftentimes, you know, at the DNC is that they're completely they do not have their shit together you know there's not this great sophisticated strategy there's no like puppet master pulling the strings or setting the agenda it's just everyone like trying to hang on to their paycheck and like you know get to the next like freaking quarter essentially it's so relatable but also so sad yeah <laughs> It so, really hurts the inside because it's like you grow up, you know, I don't know how you guys were, but you grew up with this like idealized version of how government works when you're like eight, nine, ten years old. You assume yeah, schoolhouse rock. Yeah, you assume like, hey, it works. You know, this is a this is a beautiful system that we've have in place. It's amazing. And then as you get older, you're just like, wow, this is just does not work at all. This is there's so many problems and, and both diabolical and hilarious. Yeah. You know, it, 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 like to me, it's like that's the that's the tragedy of it is that on one hand your heart breaks and your heart weeps for, for the devastation and the disgustingness and the, and the vileness that you see come out of some of the policy decisions or the CIA and things like that. And on the other hand, you're holding your stomach, falling on the ground, laughing, going like, my God, they're really this inept. They really don't know what they're doing. Uh, you know, who the, how the hell do you think like this? You know, and then after having lived in DC, you understand it because ultimately DC is a bubble. It's you know you when you live in that world and that's all that's around you you are so it's not it's not hyperbole you are so out of touch with the reality of what people are going through across the country or if you do see it then when you get to DC you know that machine just steamrolls all of that over and then you get caught in that thing of well I got to play the game so maybe maybe eventually I can get this bill passed. You know, maybe eventually and you don't want to fucking get how it's booted done. out of Congress while you're there. So you're like, well, I do want to get reelected because then I'll never get this done. Right. Yeah, it's all, it's all bullshit. It's by design, though. Right. It, it, oh. It's to thwart meaningful, swift change. That's why you have to come in with like a fucking iron fist. That's why the last time we got meaningful change in this country was after the fucking Great Depression and World War Two happened. Like, you know what I mean? It's like it took all of that. Like that, that, that 
stretch. And then we were like, you know what, actually, what if we just pretended that World War II never ended and we built our economy off war and finance forever? It's like, that sounds great. Here we are 100 years later, completely fucked. Exactly. Yeah, you couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly the issues that we have today. And, you know, so when I, as I, as you asked me, do I, what do I see of this election? I, to me, it just seems kind of, Part of me wants to sit back and watch the clown show and, and just sit back and enjoy it and, and kind of, I think it was George Carlin who who said, you know, once you kind of check yourself out of humanity, you can then sit back and watch humanity and watch what it does and, and not feel, uh, you can kind of sit back and enjoy the show as it, as it swirls down the drain. Um, but the other part of me, part of me wants to do that, this election, the other part of me is passionate and and I do want to see real change take place and I do want to see some candidates get elected that actually are leading from the heart and what they believe in and are not sitting controlled and puppeteered or or, or who have the will to stand up against uh that steamroller that is Washington DC and Capitol Hill and, and that lobbying industry. I don't know if we're gonna see that this year, but I will say this: regardless of the outcome of 2024. You still, no matter what, win, lose, or draw, you still have to keep pushing forward with what you believe in. If you want to change this country for the better, do not base your wins and losses on who gets elected or who doesn't. You keep your eyes to the horizon and you keep pushing and pushing and pushing because that's that's the only way you're ever going to move the needle. And, you, and I think people have to get out of the headspace that if I don't see the change I want in the next one, two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, it's still worth fighting for. It's because, like, when you're talking about real political change and 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 fighting to make people's lives better, whether it's universal health care, whether it's ending the wars, rolling back the military industrial complex, these aren't things that get done in a generation. Yeah, you know, these are things that are generational changes, and you have to look at it like that. And that's that's the goal. Just keep pushing forward. Don't stop, regardless of who to, who the fuck gets elected to office. Yeah, totally. And especially when it comes to the presidency, I mean, a lot of people, especially in the Bernie era, the post Bernie era, you know, they're just like sitting here waiting for the next like, you know, nationwide movement, something like a, a Bernie 2016 or 2020 to happen, I, myself included, you know, I'd love nothing more than for the left to really get organized again uh, for us to become like a serious threat at an electoral level. Um, but we can't just sit here waiting for that to happen. If you believe in those politics, then, you know, there's candidates at your local level that need your support. There's a revolution happening in your own hometown, probably that, you know, needs your participation. Bro, speaking much of that, <laughs> there's a huge vote in Kansas City to put a stadium downtown and displace the entire arts district. And uh, there is only one city councilman in all of Kansas City that's coming out opposed to it, even though it will likely fail because the actual residents of Kansas City are so mammothly opposed to it so yeah that's the kind of shit that you can really raise a ruckus about eric bunch i'm looking at you fuck you i'm really disappointed no, he's in you. not the I one handed... that dude is not the one dude i handed out flyers for that fucking asshole i stood on the street corner <laughs> and had to negotiate with people they were like what's this guy gonna do for me and i was like not much bro but listen like <laughs> he's got the bike lanes down that's kind of something you know what i, I like mean? The, i like the stand on the street. what's he gonna do for you well not a lot but what am i supposed to I, dude i'm in like the shittiest part of kansas city outside of baha'i center and i'm talking to a dude that's like got no cash bro and i'm like hey man listen i'm not gonna bullshit you but i'm here because i'm like good. trying like to participate that. in civics and you're here because you're trying to participate in civics and i think this is the way to go bro if you're asking me this guy's at large you can vote for him wherever you live you know or no he's not at large but you know what i mean <laughs> Zach, I like that though, man. I like the honesty in that, man. It, dude, like, you, and I mean, that, that, you know, look, I'll be honest, that kind of honesty in activism on a ground level is actually needed. It's not popular. You, you, need, you need a certain amount of no bullshit. Like, look, are we going to change the world tomorrow? Is it really going to make your life better tomorrow or next year? Probably not. But it's the act. Keep I was like, moving, we all walk on the, the sidewalks, bro. You know, <laughs> right. Anyway. Mm. Uh, yeah, so at a local level, it matters a lot. And, and Tyrell, uh, one last thing from me: if you if you ever want to take a you know a, a pulse at where the left's at, I woke up this morning and basically everybody on left Twitter was like, "Who should we nominate in 2028?" I'm like, "Guys, we're in an election year right now. We could all be talking about this election." And they're all like, "I think Sean Fain by 2028, bro. I think that's a lock in, bro. I think this is our guy." And I'm like, "Bro, makes we have." Uh, you know, six months, seven months to make a splash here. There's people no concern about that. It's like, oh, yeah, scratch. It's going to go Biden or Trump. I'm like, 
that that's the kind of mentality that we got to root out. And I get it. Like nobody feels like anybody has a clear roadmap to the presidency right now, but just to move your eye four years down the road, when we're constantly telling people how we have no time to, you know, to lose no time to waste every second counts in the face of like fucking ecological disaster and the, you know, untold suffering of the people in Gaza, but just in the, you know, third world global South period, right. You know, Indonesia is going to be underwater in a decade. You know what I'm saying? Like, big problems that we're going to all have to address that's going to lead to fucking you know mass mobilization north not to the countries like the united states it's going to happen in eurasia and that's going to cause a global fucking phenomenon that's going to add water to our conflict with iran it's going to add conflict to india pakistan's conflict also the world's going to be getting hotter yada 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 nobody's talking about any of that shit they're waiting until 2028 i'm just like i want to pull my fucking hair out <laughs> i feel you on that front i feel you on that front and then and you know the thing that's the thing right like it's not about you can't get wrapped up in just simply the wins and the losses of an election. You know, the, the elections are going to come. They're going to keep coming. What you have to really focus on is what are the quality of people that you're trying to push forward? What are the quality of ideas? Not even people. What are the quality of ideas that you're trying to fight for? And really hone in on those, you know, and 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 understand that, like, we're ne it's never going to be perfect. It's not, The world is not going to spin to where all of your great ideas are the ones that get chosen. But you can move that battleship a little bit. You can move that aircraft carrier a little bit in the direction that you need it to go. Because, look, we are facing some serious problems, as you mentioned. We need a new class of intelligent leader to help us get through that. And we also need, as a people, to be more informed about these things. Because, again, we cannot put all our eggs in the basket of one or two or three or four or 20 Congress people. We have to do this as a society and move forward as a society to make this to tackle some of those things that you mentioned and to be prepared for some of those things that you mentioned. And, you know, look, I, I when I say my line on, on watching the Hawks all the time, you know, in this world, we're not loved enough. So I tell you all I love you. Part of that. And the, one of the reasons I say that is to remind people that we have to start. This is going to sound very hippy dippy, but I believe it with every fabric of my soul. We have to lead with love. We have to lead with compassion. That is the only way that we can at least have the, the starting ground to make those changes we're talking about. And, and to everybody has to realize and stop being so narrow in their focus of me and I, because that's all I fucking hear in the US right now is me and I, me and I, me and I. I don't hear anything bigger of us as a group, us as a society, my community, my neighbors, my family, that's where you got to lead from. And recently I did a, I guest hosted a radio show on WCCO up here in Minneapolis. And I came across an interesting poll that actually said that when polled, a lot of Americans actually like 80 some percent of Americans, 70 to 80% across all demographics have hope. That's a big, that's a big find. I, I, I pray that that, that, the, that polling that I saw was correct because that's a good place to be yeah. and to sit back and view the world knowing all the bullshit that we have going on and all of the tragedy and all of the heartache and all of the violence that if we still can hold on to that little glimmer of hope that hey the future is going to be better that's what then inspires us to combat all of those problems that you're talking about yeah Yep. It's, uh, As I puff away on my cigarettes and aim to end my life before the global warming sets in, <laughs> um, people often ask me why I smoke cigarettes. Well, I've seen don't what the, grow old, maybe so I don't want to see half cancer. the United States underwater. I'd rather go with cancer. There you go. Don't well, hey, I, you know, there's a there's a lot of cutting edge science out there. You know what I mean? You know, we some genetically modified calves lungs. You know, we get them in there. And, you know, <laughs> there was a gentleman that lived 70 uh, to 70 the other day in an iron lung. Tyrell, you know, we're we'll spending, we're spending money where you can give a pill to your dog now and have your dog live longer. Yeah. Really? Like, well, hey, kind of oh, yeah, there's there's there. science now where they're for like medium sized dogs. You can start giving you the dog this certain pill. And this pill will extend for the dog's life by like five to five years or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. What? Oh, trust me, humans are coming next because, you know, as, as uh, Ben What's Shapiro. What's in the pill? I don't know, but as Ben Shapiro wants, you know, all of us old people to start like working deep into our 80s, um, we need those pills to extend life uh, so we can keep that working class working. You know, yeah. trust me on that one. You can see yeah, that writing the, on the wall real quick. Here's the pill to keep you working until you're 120. Get at it. <laughs> anyway, at really, it. really appreciate you stopping by the show today, Tyrell. Really, really appreciate your insights into the, you know, 2024 race, as well as your, you know, message of optimism. I totally agree, especially, uh, you know, speaking as far as the left is concerned. I think we should try to harness that hope, right? 
Like a lot of times the left loves nothing more than to be nihilistic. We love nothing more than to just sit here and point out everything that's wrong with the world and how it's never going to get fixed. Um, but that that does inspire me, Tyrell, what you're saying about that percentage of Americans that does at least feel hope. And I think that that, you know, can and absolutely should be harnessed, um, you know, by the left, hopefully. But yeah, thank you so much, Tyrell. Really appreciate you stopping by today. Yeah, always, always great pleasure. to see you, man. And I'll I'll have big news for you guys next month. I'll I'll come on and oh uh, yeah, and, uh, let you guys know about some big big projects that me and uh, me and the body, the governor, my father were uh, were working on that I think is gonna be really exciting and and that uh, I think you guys will enjoy. Hell yeah, sweet. Looking forward, Looking forward to it. All right, take care. Peace out, bro. All right, thank you, Tyrell, for joining today. And breaking news: this is this is something that I was excited. I learned this today uh midstream had to follow up with old gavin about this guy um, i wanted to talk to my most recent supporter gavin i wanted to say that despite our intense differences <laughs> i wanted to reassure you that you know despite our intense disagreements on gaza i'm hoping we can relate to each other that i haven't given up my investigation into the ashkenazi jew population and the chinese commitment to undermining global health with the COVID 19 jab and virus um, so don't worry i'm still prepared to to keep fighting for you and uh you're a kennedy person i i can see a kennedy person i i look i look at you i not that other guy not so much i'm not sure why he's he's still on this program um but for you you have a real head on your shoulders gavin i just i want to thank you for your vocal support and I, i'm gonna pray for you uh and so is rabbi shmuley my dear friend <laughs> Well, wow. yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. We, we a might personal really... message. Wow, he must be hurting for support. He, he's custom. Uh, it just it lie, in real time. He must have. You know, the CIA must have. You know, somebody must have got him in. The, don't hurt myself. Like guys, people think it hurts to do that impression. It doesn't. I mean, what has to what has to hurt? <laughs> anyway, yeah, we did we did seemingly dodge a bullet though because I don't I don't believe that Jesse's gonna be RFK's vice president. That's what I took away from that conversation, um, which saved you all from the dynamic of me becoming a, a cautious potential sort of kind of supporter of rfk you know if jesse's that been a heart, great for content if he's a heartbeat away from the presidency jesse ventura bro like I, I would have to at least consider it but i don't think we're gonna have to contend with that uh that choice <laughs> yeah we also learned um yeah as rfk or oh, rfk as ronwell was uh wondering jesse obviously has the exact opposite position of rfk on gaza uh, you know, he's a peace first guy, as Tyrell indicated, and I believe it would help him with young voters uh, as we address that poll that showed he was the most favored vice presidential pick with people under 30. However, I don't think that Tyrell is like really like comfortable speculating on the like specifics of how, you know, the governor's uh, presence would impact RFK's campaign, just because I don't think that he sees a likely outcome where that happens, particularly as you know, he pointed out like, dude, this running for vice president is not a fucking joke. Like he's a 72 year old man. Like you have to understand what you're asking somebody to do. Uh, yeah. You know, Jesse's not just going to drop his whole life on a dime and go work for somebody else. Like that's not that's not going to happen. He's not, you know, at that point in his career, like he would not be required to do that. So why would he do that? Just, I mean, it's a huge opportunity potentially, but it it just. The way that it's been presented, it, you could pretty much tell it wasn't going to work out that way. I think that all along, RFK has known exactly who he's going to pick. I think he's had discussions with that person. I think he knows that they'll accept. And I think that the, um, you know, Jesse Ventura, Aaron Rodgers thing was just a red herring. So you don't think it's going to be Rodgers? No, fuck no. Interesting. Interesting. I think there's a if real possibility. If it's Aaron Rodgers, I'll eat my fucking shoe. <laughs> I think it's a real possibility it's Aaron Rodgers just because he don't you think he kind of seems like he's at the point in his career where he's like making a like a conscious decision to sort of pivot away from just being an athlete and kind of into the world of politics like this does seem like a natural evolution for him something he might want to get involved with because it's not like he's made his you know crazy controversial uh you know vaccine uh, perspectives. It's not like he's made that a secret. He's leaned into it. So he doesn't care about being branded as like a loony or a, a you know, controversial political kind of person. Um, and, you know, from RFK's perspective, this dude would obviously bring a lot of attention, a lot of clicks, get people talking about his campaign. Ultimately, I don't think it would help him. Ultimately, I think it would, you know, make people look at his whole campaign as more of a joke than as something to take seriously. 
Uh, but I, I think he's really more concerned with just attention and getting clicks and people talking about him, which I think Aaron Rodgers would be, you know, pretty good at pretty good at uh, producing. Yeah, the only thing is that if he wants to actually run, then Aaron Rodgers can't be the quarterback for the Jets next year, and they have their entire fucking franchise staked on that guy and hundreds really? of millions of dollars wrapped up in his contract. So he would have to say it, it, it would literally cost him millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars to decide to be RFK's running mate because the Jets will not allow him to be the vice president and their fucking starting quarterback when the election's in November. He's going to have to go through all like you know what I'm saying like one of the things we were talking about with Jesse uh, or about Jesse rather thought about, you know, it's like the affairs getting all that in order. Like, of course, Aaron Rodgers is younger. He, he's probably physically up to the you know, commotion, but that's going to be taking away all of his focus. And like, I, when I say they have built the Jets franchise around Aaron Rodgers, they built it all around. They rolled out the red carpet. They said, which coaches do you want? You know, oh, you want this guy to be your backup quarterback, even though he could not be a backup quarterback anywhere else. Cause he's a fucking bad quarter, like a bunch of bad shit, right? That like the, he became the third string. Cause they had Zach Wilson, who was like a competent backup quarterback. If he doesn't have to really play for more than a game or two over a course of a season, he was miserable. Anyway, long story short, all of that stuff compounds in me saying absolutely no fucking way. It was, it was great for Aaron Rodgers to be mentioned in this breath because it gives him clout with the new audience that he's trying to poach, right? And it's good for RFK because he's trying to virtue signal to those people that like Aaron Rodgers, that those people that like this kind of deal and say, this is where my head's at, right? And he's trying to virtue signal to people like Gavin who uh, like the idea of Jesse Ventura being on the ticket. And they're like, oh, well, if that's where his head's at, then you know what I'm saying? But that's not where his head's at. His head's at somewhere else. It's a person that he already knows who it's going to be, and he's going to announce it. Because there, if he didn't reach out to Jesse, then he definitely didn't reach out to Aaron Rodgers, and he's just using their name for clicks. I, I have heard that him and Aaron Rodgers are actually kind of like friends and that they hang out together and like talk quite a bit. So it is. I do think it's possible. I mean, I saw a picture of them from months ago together that they put out recently. I don't know if they were hanging out all the time, why it would be a hike that they did a long time ago. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, he saw Jesse not that long ago too, but then still didn't reach out to the Ventura family. Yeah, so I'm not, I mean, it's not impossible, but yeah. I will be absolutely fucking beside <laughs> myself shocked if that happens. Did you see this too? Apparently Aaron Rodgers was actually in Costa Rica on an ayahuasca retreat when the news broke that he was being considered for RFK's uh, VP slot. This really does. Uh, it, it's just like a, a freaking parody, right? All these like Joe Rogan isms. I was taking ayahuasca, bro, down in Costa Rica. Isn't when it the crazy news hit. <laughs> what an impact that dude like has had on the most like, like, toxic like i don't even want to call it toxic toxic masculine culture because that makes me sound like a liberal there's just a certain bro science portion of the internet and it's so funny because it it is 100 predicated on what joe rogan thinks is interesting from a uh science standpoint or a human health standpoint or anything like that but you can go back to the early days of this shit guys i liked watching fear factor with my dad when i was a kid so i was like the perfect brainchild i worked at sarpino's when i was in high school and the, this dude shout out to my homie christian from sarpino's put me on joe rogan experience and this is like joe rogan 800 and i'm listening to like eddie wong and shane smith and all the vice guys around there and it's actually like a pretty interesting show at that point but you you have to kind of like sludge through all of the like kind of like bro science and the stupid shit. I also liked uh, the UFC a lot. So I'd listen to the fight companions and watch fights sometimes. And that was when it would all come out like the weird bro science shit. But they, all the shit that Joe R Rogan's always been talking about saunas, fasting, um, you know, not eating carbs, keto, keto, going keto. Remember when going keto was fucking huge. Yes. Thanks, Joe Rogan. That was all Joe Rogan's rage. Also, is it, uh, ayahuasca I DMT. I recently had a revelation about like, the, I think it's the keto diet. It might be the paleo one, but isn't that basically just the same thing as like what they used to call the Atkins diet? It is. It's the exact same thing. Cause I remember when I was a kid, that was like all the rage I would hear about yeah. it. And then now it's like, they just rebranded it. And got Rob Lowe does it. And he'll be like, I'm on the Atkins diet. You know, it just <laughs> works for me. It's like, I keep my carbs in check. I keep my protein levels high and I just feel better. Yeah. A hundred percent. That is the, that is exactly what it is. It's just, they've rebranded it and made it bro science. You know what I mean? And now they've taken it one step further. I remember when Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan first started flirting with the carnivore diet. Now the carnivore diet is huge. It's just a bunch of 40 year old men who are like, just like, oh, yeah, I only eat steaks now. I'm going to get ripped. And it's like, dude, 
you know you're on the carnivore diet you're not supposed to drink a 12 pack of beer with your steak right you fucking idiot you know, oh look at joe rogan says this, you know, whiskey, pump up yeah. my testosterone bro fucking, i reverse seared this steak have you ever heard of a reverse sear method yeah it's it's when you uh, uh you know heat up the steak and then you just sear it right at the end it's you know it's a it's a technique I'm like ah it's a technique wow for cooking no you don't say there's techniques for that you know and they're just like it's uh, you know oh it's just all natural for a while joe rogan was really into like the benefits of elk meat and he got really into yeah. bow hunting and then that shit took over for a while and then, remember when he was in a barefoot running how about that remember guys if you uh, when dude for the real joe rogan throwbacks i hope it makes a resurgence but there was a big push he did back in the day for barefoot running hills and that's all he would talk about i just think running hills and he would say bullshit like i don't think you should wear music when you're running either because it should just be you fighting with your mind like that's a distraction i'm like there's literally no health benefits to running without your <laughs> headphones but he was like i just think it fortifies your mind i think it makes you tougher and it's like okay yeah. dude then you run without your fucking headphones but like it's just a weird like need to project right it all comes back to the fact he's insecure about being short but we yeah. don't have to get there yeah i remember one time he was talking about like when, when i'm out in the woods like without any you know signals or cell phones like you just feel better man when there's no signals bouncing off the walls you just you just feel alive bro <laughs> I was like, you know, there's probably some truth to that, but it's still like kind of pseudoscience to just say it like a fact. <laughs> Bro, it's just, you know, it's just about getting after it. You know what I mean? It's just about conquering your inner bitch. It's just about, you know what? And then it's crazy. Do you remember when he dragged his ass because he put out that clip where he was like, I just think that there's something about being uncomfortable. You know what I mean? It's just like making yourself uncomfortable. It's like my brother in Christ, you live on a compound in Austin, yeah. Texas. What do you mean make yourself uncomfortable? Oh, I sit in the sauna and do yeah. cold plunges. Oh, you mean you work Burn out? Five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, okay that's the same thing as suffering like a fucking <laughs> impoverished person yeah where are you, you gonna to sleep tonight you don't $10, know thousand dollar chamber to simulate what suffering feels like literally literally it's insane <laughs> you're like yeah, put dude. on your vr goggles you're like man you know actually i just get in the shower and i pretend that i'm like you know lost at sea you know and i'm like wow this is what it's like on deadliest catch you know and i'll be getting on my rowing machine you know what i mean and it's like crazy you know what I mean? Sometimes my wife comes down to bitch at me, but I just tell her I'm in my caveman zone. She can't. Oh. Yeah, dude. Funny stuff. Yeah, maybe Joe something... Rogan. Maybe Joe Rogan should be RFK's vice presidential pick. That would at least be a little bit more. You Bro, know, I hope exciting. this is a joke, Brian, because a lot of people take medical advice from Joe Rogan. Like I'm, like I'm just saying, like <laughs> yeah, a huge yeah. amount of people. Unfortunately, yeah, a lot of people do i think that brian's probably kind of being like sarcastic like who the fuck would you know listen to joe rogan for medical advice you should and but oh bro it's a double blind study bro oh <laughs> did you read that study why well, had a doctor oh, yeah how much money is that guy making off of this new equipment that he's selling us right oh uh, no dude yeah no she's uh she's just really interested in like uh you know health and and stuff like that oh it's crazy that nobody else has thought to maybe replicate that because you know the, the beauty of uh oh i, I yeah I, I i was making sure brian just making sure <laughs> um, anyway no. apac owns most members of congress that's true can't argue with that brian spitting a fact right there um and also he adds that pelosi's speech on the tiktok but anytime you have somebody over the age of like 55 talk about an app it's cringy as shit did you see this one Zach? yeah the, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah this shit is wild this is like probably the, one of the cringiest things I've heard since the Pokemon go to the polls. Uh, but this one's not even as like structured. At least that kind of had like a, a point like, oh, let me reference this thing that's popular. Tic-tac-toe. Who the fuck is out here playing tic-tac-toe? Anyway, let's take a look. This is not an attempt to ban TikTok. It's an attempt to make TikTok better. Tic-tac-toe. A winner. <laughs> a winner. <laughs> Unhinged. <laughs> oh man oh, she wait. thought she was girl bossing too she thought she was having a moment i'm like oh nancy please retire also dude i nine people are gonna call me ageist in chat that's fine she looks like the lady in brazil after she's gotten her face fucked with you know yeah. what i mean like yeah. i i mean i i'm like you're so old and you've had so much work done like you you just should let yourself be like a hunch over old lady you know how old ladies used to get all that same haircut it would be all like done up like that and kind of gray yep. you know and then they would get the big glasses what happened to that what happened to that huh whatever happened to the twilight years nancy whatever happened to playing bridge you know drinking martinis at two in the afternoon eating dinner at 4 30 and passing out in front of you know nightline you know what i'm saying what happened nancy those could have been you know 
you had a big house, a nice husband. Why couldn't you? Why couldn't you just rock back and forth on your porch or something? Mm? Man, TikTok. It's an attempt to make TikTok better. Tic Tac Toe. A winner. A winner. <laughs> a winner. A winner. <laughs> I'm like no, it's like she's short, short circuited. Like you know, it's like whatever the like, whatever pulses they have going up the back of her spine, you know, to make sure that she still you know functions. They're like still testing it out. It's cutting edge technology. I'd 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 wager. You know, you've got somebody in the background, you know, controlling her with like an Xbox 360 controller, you know, and and they meant to. You know, you're supposed to do the little like tap thing where where it's like X Y X Y R T or left T left trigger right and they just bumped it up a little bit and then they did it again ah, ah there we go now i've got it anyway <laughs> yep shout out to you once again brian for the five bucks ben shapiro sits in his air-conditioned studio calling for people to work until they die he's never done any manual labor in his life yeah did you see this clip zach oh 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 how could i have missed this banger <laughs> Yeah, let's take a quick look here. This was wild, just going full fucking mask off. Like at this point, most Republicans are like they know better than to just come out here and, and be this just like fucking psycho when it comes to stuff like Social Security and retirement. But Ben Shapiro apparently just never got the memo um, because this is what he's been saying. And let's be real about this. It's insane that we haven't raised the retirement age in the United States. It's totally crazy. Joe Biden. If that were the case, Joe Biden should not be running for president. Hey, Joe Biden is 81 years old. The retirement age in the United States at which you start to receive. And this doesn't make any fucking sense to me because he starts off by saying, like, it's crazy that we that we uh, have a retire a retirement age. We should make it higher. But then him and tons of other conservatives constantly point out that Biden is way too fucking old to be doing the job of the presidency. So it's like, yeah, that's why there's a fucking retirement age, bro. It's too bad that Joe Biden didn't actually retire when he should have obviously no one's forced to retire but yeah that's why it is where it is like because once you're much older you kind of stop being as good at being able to work i would even be willing to entertain a 30-year run like you can you know from 35 to 65 you're allowed to enter into politics after that no you know or you can enter politics at a you know congressional level whatever the laws you know what i'm saying i think you get 30 years i think you say hey you want to be president 65 maybe we push it to 70 after that get the fuck out dude i'm sorry you, you gave it a nice shot i know everybody gets told in kindergarten that they could be president unfortunately you can't be president anymore it didn't work out for you i never got to start for the knicks <laughs> um you know what i mean but yeah. as it stands we let yeah we let 81 year olds and we should just encourage people to be retiring at 65 and once again enjoying those you know twilight bring back bridge that's our, that's our slogan see <laughs> social security and you are eligible for medicare is 65 joe biden has technically been eligible for social security and medicare for 16 years and he wants to continue in office until he is 86 which is 19 years past when he would be eligible for retirement so is it a, I, I don't is it a bad thing for people that are 80 to be working or not? I can't fucking tell because on one hand, he's saying that people should keep working far beyond 65. But then, like I said, him and his ilk will constantly point out that Biden is clearly too goddamn old to be president. I this is so garbled. No one in the United States should be retiring at 65 years old. Frankly, I think retirement itself is a stupid idea unless you have some sort of health problem. See? Everybody that I know who is who is elderly, who has. He's like, they want to work forever. It's like, well, then what's your problem with Joe Biden? Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. It's crazy. Retired is dead within five years. And if you talk to people who are, that's so fucking stupid too. Who is elderly, who has retired is dead within five years. And if you talk to people who are elderly and they lose their purpose in life by losing their job and they stop working, things go to hell in a handbasket. Can real pause quick. It one more time right there. That's the problem with the right wingers. They like, have this weird obsession with like your job is your only identity. Yep. And one of the things that I've really tried to work on myself is like making my job not my identity because it's something that's like really easy to do, especially if you're fortunate enough to do something that you love to do, right? Where it's like, oh, like Gavin and I, we do a podcast. Like I make cocktails, Gavin makes movies. Like we're fortunate to do shit that we like to do, but it's like, it, it's hard to not live and die by the results of that if you make it your identity, right? And then it's like a, a bad month or not a lot of views. And you're like, oh, well, I should just fucking kill myself then because uh, <laughs> like, I'm incapable of doing what I'm fucking serving a purpose of or whatever, right? And it's like really bad for your brain. 
I think that's one of the you know most effective arguments for socialism for early retirement. And I don't even like this idea that you should be like waiting your whole life to relax when you're 65, but it should be those are the times where you're able to share your wisdom, share what you learned over the course of your life and pass that information on to the next generation. You shouldn't be emburdened by you know, toiling away at an office job or doing whatever, like your purpose should still be in your community. Like, I think that, you know, doing a better job of valuing our elders for what they're capable of providing will come when our elders are no longer like fucking dictating our lives and making sure that we can't advance in corporation be, oh, well, this guy's 75 and he's the CEO. So that means that like everybody else that's 40 and 50 and that has been busting their ass to get ahead. Yeah, they're all way in line before you, pal, because somebody decided, hey, uh, my only purpose in life is to fucking, you know, look at spreadsheets and maximize profit or whatever the yeah. fuck. You know what I mean? Yeah. And obviously, I mean, it goes without saying, but Ben Shapiro is speaking from just such a place of immense privilege. Like he's he's like one of the very few people who actually gets to, you know, own a company, do what he wants, set his own schedule. Like he's not being controlled by some boss. He's not working under a bunch of other people at a corporation like the vast majority of the workforce is, including old people that, you know, work at fucking Walmart or whatever to make ends meets but it, it's completely ridiculous to say that you know working at walmart as a 90 year old or as like a 75 year old somehow gives you more purpose than like hanging out with and raising your grandchildren or something like what most people in that age range would actually want to be playing doing. chess with foster kids you know doing yeah. hanging out like all the cool stuff that you get to do when you're retired that's obviously a hundred times more read fucking at a kindergarten fulfilling. yeah um, I, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. A lot of uh, older people travel a lot. Like before my grandparents got as old as they are, they would take cruises like they fucking love taking cruises like that's the best shit ever. You get a fucking hang out, do what you want. And obviously not everyone is in a privileged position to you know do whatever you want for sure. But like if if you are, then obviously you'd rather be doing that than fucking slaving away at a gas station as a clerk you know fucking humiliating yourself as an old person you know selling slurpees to like seventh graders or whatever like no one wants to do that it's deeply undignified um and again not everyone is in why is it undignified people. gavin oh <laughs> gavin over here this man he's like well if you're not uh, editing videos and uh you know talking into a microphone it dignity man gavin are you british we've um, i i have started getting some of these sensibilities you know what i mean uh boy uh, I, oh, I, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah anyway completely ridiculous from the of an englishman an englishman i do have english blood unfortunately e fi fo fum <laughs> speaking of uh the work week and all that stuff though here's a nice contrast did you see this sec bernie sanders calling for a 32 yeah, hour bernie work sanders week. trying to win us back now after he <laughs> fucking just absolutely just torpedoed his <laughs> reputation on the yeah you know among the young american left uh the international left frankly i mean this is based right and this is the kind of shit that bernie would get up to before he even ran for president um like if you look at bernie's track record in the senate this is the stuff that he was interested in this is the kind of stuff that he was um spending his time doing will it lead to anything no 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 it won't lead to anything but it it is cool it is something that we should be for uh you know pushing for uh it, I I do agree that it's not actually going to pass or anything, but I do think it's important to like start, you know, sowing the seeds, so to speak of, of these sort of ideas. Um, because much like Bernie's entire agenda that he put forward in 2016, even just a few years earlier, much of that would have not been taken seriously by the American public. Like, Oh, Medicare for all. Who the fuck are you? You know, like some radical leftist, uh, free college. What is this? Who are you fucking Jill Stein? Um, but Bernie did normalize those policies. And if he can normalize a 32 hour work week and make it a popular policy as one of his, you know, final kind of, uh, accomplishments as a Senator, I think that would be pretty lit. Cause that's something that we absolutely need especially as AI and automation continues to take away important jobs. It's like, yeah, we should be working less. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, he's at least planting these seeds of this idea. Hopefully it does really catch on. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it, Bernie's certainly not the first person to kind of present these ideas. I remember one of our first Vanguard articles that we did back when the Vanguard was uh, still a blog was called where the fuck is our 15 hour work week? You know what I mean? Where the fuck is our 426 nine work week? You know what I'm saying, gang? Uh, no, I agree. It's like worthwhile to like keep 
you know this into discussion or keep this in the discussion and i think that you know bernie has a lot of sympathies for keynesian style economics and we saw that through his you know two presidential runs uh, so i'm not mad at it i think it's based but you know i still got my eye on bernie he's still on my <laughs> shit list i don't know what to say <laughs> yeah i feel you bro i feel you um another thing we wanted to take a look at that we've been putting off now for a while is some clips from the recent debate between a bunch of people, but Norm Finkelstein and destiny were among them. I think it was four people, two on the Palestine side, two on the Israel side. Um, and this was interesting. You know, some people even remarked that Norm Finkelstein on our show on the Vanguard was mocking destiny and, and saying that he probably wasn't going to debate him, but I guess he did eventually agree after the debate was set up by Lex Friedman and then he was invited, you know, not just to debate destiny, but to debate destiny alongside this other like Israeli historian figure. I feel bad because I don't know his name, but I know this person is considered quite serious. One of the preeminent like, you know, historians of uh, Israeli history from what I know. Um, but yeah, do you want to, he's obviously smarter than destiny when it comes yeah. to, the, or I, far better educated to be, polite and probably more specific but yeah destiny just doesn't come off being very well educated on this issue at all for somebody who prides himself on being like a research debate bro he just he really comes off looking terrible he's he needs he comes off looking terrible like a soulless fucking ghoul um which is i mean par for the course if you've heard any of his other commentary on the you know conflict uh, destruction of <laughs> gaza but anyway we can let it play whenever you're ready to get yeah, these are the clips going around. Just to be fair, I have not seen the full five-hour debate. So if you guys want to accuse us of, you know, cherry picking the best moments, we are cherry picking. We are absolutely. <laughs> this is we're we're here to reflect on the discourse. The the nobody else is watching the full five hours either. You I'm sorry. You do a five-hour piece of content like people are watching 10 15 minutes of that collectively after some poor bastard was like you know what for the cause i'm gonna go out and i'm gonna clip this and put it on twitter and for those you know about to clip we salute you yep all right let's take a look I'm I'm sure they attack, it. and if the hamas sure is hiding behind sure civilians, they believe, civilians every die. time they target Simple every time they target a kid i'm sure they believe it's hamas when they kid yeah when they yeah when they kill the four kids in the on the uh they believe yeah they i know they believe it. even though they were you know diminutive that, they, side you know even though they were yeah, diminutive, that angle, you yeah, don't yeah, see the side yeah, no, they saw you don't see the side let's, let's leave the side oh i know what he's quoting here you've lied about this in the past those kids weren't just on the beaches as often stated article those kids were literally coming out of a previously identified hamas compound that they have operated from they literally said you can google it with all, respect, with all due respect, did you hear they said Mr. Borelli? Doesn't this is it's Stephen Bonnell is who he's talking to? He just doesn't give a fuck. He's like, <laughs> listen here, Mr. Borelli. <laughs> We gotta hear that again. You're they literally Mr. Said you can Borelli, you can Mr. Borelli, with all Mr. due respect, Finkelstein. with all due respect, yeah. you're such a fantastic moron. It's uh -huh. terrifying. That that wharf was filled with journalists. There were tens scores of journalists. That was an old fisherman's shack what are you talking about it's so painful it's so painful to listen to this idiocy and to but be clear on the other side you're implying okay. that I'm sure that i love how they cut it right there after after norm mic throw. he literally does the mic drop motion to it's so painful to listen to your and it's crazy too because uh there is so much propaganda for you to just find that'll be like oh yeah i'm sure wherever they commit a casualty that you could find an article from the fucking israeli government that says oh it was actually a hamas outpost and he was like it was an old fisherman's shack bro and he killed all the fucking people there the children and you're like wow blah, blah, blah. but this next one this next clip that we're about to show is is probably the most incriminating just the, the most one? Absolutely. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. There's no coming back from this. And basically, a lot of people have been saying there's no point in actually engaging with this to try and debunk it. It's just exposing that like, this is the deranged, impenetrable view of the most ardent, you know, heavily propagandized Zionist. And I also want to illustrate that fucking destiny is a just a chud from omaha okay so it doesn't matter what your upbringing is you can be indoctrinated mm -hmm. with any radical belief system and that's exactly what this is that's why you see people like uh you know mike pompeo who are rabid you know pro-zionist they're from you know a place like kansas you know what i mean it's not 
at all correlated to the, like a commitment to the Jewish faith at all. Trust me, Destiny is not like a devoutly like fucking religious person in any capacity. Yeah. If you watch his content, that's absolutely clear. Uh, so it, it's just again under under my or underlies the the like lie that like oh to critique zionism is to critique judaism because you will see somebody just viciously defend it who's completely um you know without religion like a secular person yeah totally that's a great point top down Sorry. racial domination enacted through top down like federal legislative policies or whatever means that i don't know if um I don't know if Jim Crow would have qualified have for part. That doesn't make it any less. Excuse me, Finkelstein. I'm talking right now. Excuse me, excuse me, Finkelstein. I'm talking to your friend over here. Um, I don't know if it would have qualified as the crime of apartheid. Just like if Israel were to literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of In genocide. In your eyes, probably. Top. Oh. One, how are you going to argue that Jim Crow South wasn't an apartheid yeah, system? Like fuck? he said, literal top down suppression. Yes. Little separate set of laws. Yes. Separate places to live. Yes. What are you talking about? There weren't so, oh, you could, no, no, separate everything. Separate everything. Also, mass oppression. Oh, oh, these, oh, the black water fountains were just as good. Like revisionist fucking history, deranged, like offensive. So fucking recent to now. People who are alive lived through that. That's what's crazy about it. And honestly, man, like, topic of discussion for another day people really need to relearn that part of american history because they fuck it off so much in school that i get it if you don't take the time to go back and learn like how fucking brutal the fucking timeline was from the end of reconstruction until the civil rights era. like all the fuck it like everybody knows emmett till go ahead go look that look that story up look that story up you know what I mean? But just the day that fucking dude lynchings continued in the South unprosecuted, bro. A, a lot of people would argue that that shit hasn't even that to this day. You'll still see that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, to argue that yeah. that was not apartheid, like that just sets you up. And then he's like, oh, and also you could exterminate all these people and it still wouldn't be genocide. Yeah. You want us to take you seriously? It's just like you're just a fucking you're just a contrarian and you have no morals and you have no soul and you have no heart in there. It's like insanity yeah 100 100 percent. the couple more clips here that might be worth reacting to just like 20 second clips here this one's pretty funny i love the way that norm says wikipedia every time essentially um essentially yes if, uh, as in i'm just saying that yeah. essentially yeah, as in terms of how international law defines it not how amnesty international defines it but amnesty international describes times of human shielding but they don't actually apply the correct international legal you standard know what's the correct i know absolutely you no, haven't but, the but, no, i absolutely you have the correct. I absolutely I, I, I think, but um but i'm just saying Wikipedia. i'm just saying i'm just you saying believe it, it or not yeah there you go. the other it's guy tough. is like see I don't, i'm not sure who the gentleman is sitting next to norm finkelstein but He's like looking over, like, like every time that Norm gets like really fucking angry, he's like, "Bro, you're not going to be able to reach this guy." Like, yeah. it's just like you know. And I get it, but it's like I also admire the fact that, like, you know, Norm Finkelstein will still go out there. He'll sit across from him. He'll scream at him. He'll be like, "Look, dude, people have to know that you're a fucking crazy person. That people have to know that your views that you're holding are just with it, like, just completely outside the realm of what's acceptable." But here is the real fucking kicker, guys. The viewpoint that's held by the mainstream media is the one that's being articulated by destiny over here. And that, that should, I, I mean, that should break everybody's brain, right? It's broken mine over the past fucking, you know, six months, however long it's been the fact that they're like, Oh yeah, no, nothing. There is no red, like almost nobody. I mean, we've seen one or two clips on CNN during the worst of the worst. Now that they're about to invade Rafa during Ramadan. Right. And that there's already been destruction there. We've already had read accounts of torture right with um you know there's mass starvation okay even the fucking united arab emirates are saying hey if you don't let aid into gaza like it's gonna be a problem the uae okay next to, uh, <laughs> you know what i mean like uh, there's not anyone really else to draw the line and if you further humiliate the united states by doing absolutely nothing yep let's take a look here guys special intent did you read the case yeah. Uh, it is Mr. a highly Ferrelli, special intent. I'm going to ask you again. Genocide. Yes. Please stop displaying your imbecility. Okay. I'm do sorry not, if you think do, the declaration of the put on, is imbecility. Don't put on public display that ah. you're a moron. At least have the self possession to shut up. Did I I'm read the case? Special intent. Oh, God. It's so good. Inject it into my.
I, I gotta watch the rest of this debate, guys, because I I do want to pull some longer exchanges. These are all really short. Yeah. Um. So maybe maybe we'll revisit this after I try and wade through, um, more of uh more of it, because I imagine there are some really good like actual substantive exchanges, and you know, Twitter being Twitter, it's just like, you know, the dog pile, like, you know, the the tables, ladders, and chairs pile drivers kind of a deal. No. Yeah. Yeah, I think we got one more here that might be worth reacting to. Apologies if we've already seen this one, but I don't think so. Um, here's middlemaga.com saying it's been a few rough months for Destiny. Mr. Bunnell, don't change the subject. If you don't know what you're talking about, about, at least you say, have the view, at on, least have the humility. Two, you talk how, about how close chapter has two six. four two gotten? You don't know how, chapter how close six. has two four two gotten to the Palestinians? Six from tweet five. You have no idea what you're talking about. It's just so embarrassing. Huh. At least have some humility. Between us, we've read maybe 10,000 books on the topic, and you've read two Wikipedia entries, and you start talking about chapter six. Do you know what chapter seven is? Answer me. Answer you know special intent. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, wait, it's honestly. Oh, you're good. <laughs> it's so true because I, I, I get where. Uh, obviously we're normal and we're you know people in glass houses can't throw stones we have no pedigree we make aspersions about people who are far more educated than us we will disagree fervently with people who are far more educated than us have read far more books than us but it is true that at some point you do have to have a level of humility when you're talking to somebody who is just way more educated and i try and balance that right even if it's like like if we had somebody on that was like an expert in, you know, national security or something that I don't particularly value, right? As like a career path. I'll be like, oh, this guy gives me spook energy. I don't fucking trust him. I'm, uh, but I kind of want to learn what he's talking. I'm just trying to put myself in destiny's shoes. It's like somebody who is arguing with somebody who is just like in, in complete opposite position as they are, right? Um, I, I would imagine that I would at least try and be humble in the face of it, right? Um but obviously, Norm Finkelstein has dedicated his whole fucking life to this, you know? And there's only one thing that Destiny's dedicated his life to, and that's being an antagonist troll on the internet, which he's quite good at. Um, but as far as, like, delivering substantive critique in the face of somebody who has a lot of, you know... It, it is also cringy to bring up, like, chapter fucking six in verse. It gives me big, like, goodwill hunting. And, you know, like, would drastically, would, you know, oh, would drastically, under, you're going to read this until next week, and then you're going to be talking about how all of that shit was horseshit. Yeah. You know, I, you, you got an education that you could have got for a dollar fifty in late fees at the local library or whatever the fuck he says to him. That exchange uh, kind of is a lot of how I felt uh, from the brief, obviously highly selective moments from that debate maybe there are times where destiny really gets his licks in i don't know i would say after watching those clips on air i'm prepared to watch at least more than the 15 or 20 minutes i had initially planned yeah it's probably definitely worth watching at least not if not it's in, in it's god damn it if not in its entirety then at least you know a good chunk of it because i'm sure it's a very substantive exchange uh, but yeah i do love that uh that roasting norm finkelstein is so gifted in that regard and yeah obviously he's been studying this for a long ass time he literally got banned from entering the country of israel in 2008 because of his intense criticism of it calling it a jewish supremacist state um, and destiny basically just started doing his uh, wikipedia research <laughs> right after october 7th from what i can tell so i can definitely relate to and sympathize with finkelstein's frustration there and yeah that was pretty funny um, also, this is a great point, Brian. Thank you so much for the five bucks. When Destiny isn't debating an open racist or fascist and has to face someone educated on a subject, he crumbles. Yeah, we often do see that, Brian. Destiny is great at debating conservatives, right wingers, obviously, like you said, just like blatant racists and bigots when it comes to just sort of like normie uh, common sense stuff like, you know, is Trump anti democratic? destiny versus some crazy right winger and then it's like yeah he's uh he's pretty on point um or when it comes to you know other sort of normie topics he can do a really good job dominating a debate although unfortunately we didn't really see that with candace owens i was expecting him to own candace owens and i thought he was pretty meek in that debate as well 
Yeah, that's kind of the whole debate me bro thing. It's like you're either really educated on a topic and you can edu- or you can argue that topic specifically with anybody or you're just kind of good at debating. And that's the approach that Destiny's taken. So when somebody is just absolutely brainless and they're like, I don't think that white supremacy is real, like obviously then he can pull up a Wikipedia page and show the wrong. <laughs> um, anyway, it's funny though too because now any like the bro between norm finkelstein and um you know the gray zone there is like a belief that like everything on wikipedia is wrong and i will say that's like the embodiment of like left media literacy right now it's like that place is bad and then it's like oh yeah this place is good you know what i mean so to, I always, to be fair I, I don't think Finkelstein thinks the information on Wikipedia is necessarily inaccurate. I think he's just roasting Destiny for... No, no. I wasn't talking about Norm Finkelstein. We we just get a a lot of people on left Twitter that are like, wow, you read Wikipedia? And it's like, dude, everybody reads Wikipedia. It's like one of the most heavily web traffic. It's like, you read Twitter? It's like, yes, dude, I read Twitter. Like, sometimes that shit's on there. I'm capable of deducing that uh, for my own self. You know what I mean? Anyway, plus uh, that's Wikipedia literally links you to other sources that are way more in depth. So if, if you well, wanna, they call like... Max Blumenthal a conspiracy theorist. So I don't <laughs> think that's a, well. So it's 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 actually it's an op. And if you listen to Chris Hedges, Gavin, if you listen to Chris Hedges more, you would understand because Chris Hedges explains it all. In fact, he explains it so well. It's 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 a shame that you haven't heard him explain it because he explains it so good. How Max Blumenthal is absolutely not a conspiracy theorist, and how he's actually got really good takes and he's correct. So that's why you can't look at Wikipedia wikipedia anyway. yeah shout out to you brian thank you so much i think shout max to- is pissed too because i think it's i think it calls him a far left at one point it called him a far left and far right conspiracy theorist like just kind of perfectly uh, the horseshoe the conspiracy yeah, the horseshoe. <laughs> yeah i don't know if it still says that i hope it does because it was pretty funny it was literally like his twitter header it was like a screenshot of his wikipedia page where it was like max blumenthal is a far left and far right conspiracy theory. you'd be like this is impossible and it's like no dude you just you, you really thread a specific needle it's like my fa- <laughs> like dude my favorite max blumenthal moment ever was when he was on uh rising and he's like obama raped libya and he didn't get prosecuted and then it's like bro we pull up the politico article where it's like obama state department hires sydney blumenthal it's like hey man you know that blood money you were talking about flowing from the white house to uh uh you know you know, if NATO, Libya, you remember all that blood money? You love to talk about the blood money and the rape. That's what you use to pay for your cocaine every month. You know, that's the byproduct. <laughs> that's your inheritance, pal. All right. Uh, so, you know, anyway, when is the new Blumenthal standing? Oh, yes. It's, it, it's uh... a. <laughs> He's gonna be playing the uh, the uh, Besa Mesa retirement community down the block from uh, Gavin and I uh, for a little bit. Um, you know, you can only go on for for twelve minutes because then the the rest of the crowd has to you know change out their oxygen tanks and uh, you know have their asses wiped by their uh, you know medical assistants. But it's good work he's doing. Honestly, I think more people should uh, you know invest in our geriatric communities entertainment like that. I I I, I actually heard that Aaron's going to start coming out and juggling and riding on a unicycle with him. So I think it's going to be quite an act. I think it's going to be. I think it's the next chapter of their career. I'm excited to see them on America's Got Talent. Um, so anyway. That's uh, Norm was lent with WandaVision powers by Billy Maximoff against Destiny and used it to become the new champ at the main event in Debate Mania. Great job. Yeah. Ron, well, you should start writing Vanguard fan fiction. I think that'd be a good hobby for you. You know, you start on the left, you know, who do we cover for the day? You know, and I, I think that's a move. And, uh, you know, Ron, well, the Vanguard fan fiction. Yep. Absolutely. That's a great idea. Thank you so much, Ron. Well, really appreciate the five bucks. And shout out to you, Larry. Our Mr. Boopity Boppity, please have some shame and shave that shit you call a beard. LOL. Yeah, Destiny's beard did look a little a little rough in that. Um, and yeah, I loved the the um, the misnomers for Destiny throughout that debate. That was one of the funniest parts of it. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Larry. I guess that basically wraps up our discussion on the Finkelstein stuff. Yeah, not everybody can be perfectly groomed, Larry. <laughs> not everybody can grow a not patchy, dark, you know, masculine alpha. Yeah, you know, this is you know, God doesn't touch us all as it stands. Anyway, shout out to you, Timmy Ballgame. Norm absolutely embarrassed himself in that debate. LOL to, to me. I don't I we, we we just watched him crush it. So, you know, who's 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 who who are we gonna believe? You or our lying eyes, right, Timmy? I'm sorry, but thank you for the ten dollars for being a hater. Timmy Ballgame peanuts. Yeah, 
I don't know. According to the th- the according to the headline, it says Norm Finkelstein destroys destiny in debate. So, so you're, you're arguing with the facts. Look at it; it's <laughs> written in the media. The news made you, mate. Anyway, <laughs> this guy's from MSNBC. Yeah, shout out to you, Timmy. Thank you for. Bro, I love it when the haters send us money, though. Timmy, you're welcome here anytime. You're, it's like you know, fucking. <laughs> anyway, we'll probably do another show tomorrow. I imagine, unless yeah. you know, nothing happens. I guess. Balls are <laughs> LOL, dude. Do you want to commit literal acts of fucking crime? But, you know, you, I, only balls he has are his peanuts. Also, what the fuck? I'm getting a call from Cameron, Missouri, right now. I don't know anybody what? in Cameron, Missouri. It must be Timmy. He's trying to set something up. <laughs> Timmy, stay away from me, Timmy, please. I have children to think about. Yep. Anyway, yeah, we probably will be live tomorrow. I'm assuming that will. That I will mean, take Saturday place. streams always go well. I yeah. don't have shit going on tomorrow, so hell yeah. I already hell missed yeah. one day this week. I'm primed and ready. I am juiced. Everybody, go check out that Brianna Joy Gray interview that Gavin did so masterfully. You know, <laughs> it was so on course. It was so to the point. One thing after the other. You get in, you get out. There were no diatribes. Uh, shout out to Brianna for coming by. You know, I that you know. Gavin's the favorite anyway. You know, it would have been a little awkward if it was just me in there. Not with but, everyone, uh, bro. Some people, some people, they're not a huge fan. Well, yeah, the haters, you know, the yin and the yangers, you know. Yeah. Can anyway, shout out to patrons. Fun... Yeah, patrons. We might have forgotten to do that at the beginning. I think we did at the it. beginning of the live stream. So we'll shout you guys extra, extra hard. You know, uh, people answered our calls. I started making this joke. I was like, you know, we only have one celebrated actress in our uh you know super vanguardian selection or vanguardian you know i said guys get your game up like level up you know get your money right like you know take the world by the balls let's get out there in hollywood name a star after yourself on the hollywood walk of fame well we're getting one step closer we got followed by the laverne which is crazy i remember being in high school in olathe north and watching orange is the new black on my cell phone when i was supposed to be doing homework and look where it got me everybody all the way here the shining lights my own fucking you know youtube program wow could have had this in high school if only i'd have known but would the stars have been watching would they have aligned well if you want to be seen by the stars if you want to you know be listed the beginning and end or sometimes just the end because we're only human you know the shows the end credits you know of you know if you want to have your little slice of Hollywood, you know, your, your favorite movie, there's a bunch of people you've never heard of them, but you get to see their name scroll by at the end. And you're like, wow, those people were a part of history. If you want to be a part of leftist history, I'm just rambling at this point, Gavin, cut me off whenever you're ready. <laughs> yeah. Huge shout out to the Patreon community and a huge shout out to Laverne Cox, who, as Zach said, followed us on Twitter, confirming that that was most likely her who sent in that uh Jenner super chat the other day so that was super exciting but yeah huge shout out to all the every Patreons. party needs a pooper that's why we <laughs> invited you <laughs> yep thanks for he's the got the dunce cap though. now though he's got the dunce <laughs> cap now timmy ball game let's see if timmy ball game has the balls to come back next week make sure to hit the like button on your way out or the down vote either way it works in our favor in the algorithm you know i respond to all the haters in the comment mm-hmm. section by the way so take a crack at us leave your best shot see if you can bat with the big boys uh, <laughs> see if you can take what you dish out because i will fucking wreck you all i love it too it's good sport even if you're a fan go ahead and leave a hateful comment it keeps me on my toes there you go yeah we welcome the haters it's an important part of our community um but yeah peace out everyone we'll be back tomorrow Enjoy the rest of your Friday evening. Peace out. Peace.